All right, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. This is uh, uh, just a revelation that's burning in me right now, and I'm going to preach it hard. So you better hear softly because your head will explode if you don't. It's okay. That made no sense, but it just flowed out, so I said it. Okay, so the title of the sermon today is Faith Versus Fear, The Final Frontier. Faith versus fear, the final frontier, right? It just kind of flows. So the final frontier, what does that mean? We are in a season right now that it's very strategic. You don't need to just be guessing through life and just hoping things work out. I would say the most important word for you is strategery, as George Bush said one time. It's not a word. To be strategic in your life, to really listen to what God is saying. Ask him if you don't know, Lord, what is in this moment what am I supposed to be doing to be faithful with what I have right now? Don't worry about if God would just do this or if that'll happen or what's tomorrow. God says, because we always pray about God to do something for t- about tomorrow, and God's saying, yeah, but today, with what you have now, what are you doing? And some of you go, I don't know what I have now. I don't know what's happening. I'm just here. Okay, then, Lord, what is it in this moment of my life, in this season, at this job, in this age, at this point in life, am I supposed to be doing? It could be something that you think is insignificant. I prayed over someone earlier, and I said, right now in this season, God is telling you to lead your family well, because if you're faithful with this, what he has for you on a large scale will begin to open, the doors will open. But if you're not leading at home, then you can't lead out there. So what do you need to be faithful with in this season of your life? Because we are stepping into a whole new realm that the world has never seen, the greatest time in history. So faith and fear are two opposite forces. And I want to talk about them today because the enemy will use fear to try to stop you, disqualify you, or scare you out of advancing to what God's called you to advance to, to take the territory you're supposed to. It is the greatest uh, uh, test, I think, of our lives is, are we going to walk in faith? Are we going to walk in fear? And let me tell you, you cannot advance beyond either one of those. Fear is a border that will stop. If you let it stop you, you can never advance past your fears. But let me tell you, you can never advance past your faith either. So if your faith is here, then guess what? Your whole life will get up to here. God might have called you all the way to that back of the sanctuary right there, and that's the timeline for your life. But if your faith can only handle what's right here and you can't receive that, then you will only, you will be paralyzed right here for the rest of your life. The children of Israel, 40 years, an 11-day walk took 40 years. Now you have to, I mean, even if trial and error and you don't know where you're going, at some point within 40 years, you would accidentally get to the 11-day, you know, place that you're trying to get to, even if you messed up a thousand times. Surely it didn't take 40 years. It's the same principle all throughout Scripture. If you can't handle what you have now, then you won't be faithful with where God is bringing you tomorrow. If you're going to complain and devalue this moment in your life, then God cannot advance you in life because that will be uh, squandered if you can't handle what's in front of you right now. So if you're complaining about this season, then guess what? You're going to be in it longer than you want to be. But as soon as you figure out what you're supposed to be doing now and forget the feelings, then God says, now you're proving yourself. We're going to advance you, and you're going to mature. So fear and faith are the borders, the frontiers that keep us. Luke chapter 8. This is one of my favorite stories. I think I preach from this portion of Scripture more than any other in all my time in ministry. And I'm only going to read a few verses here in Luke chapter 8. This is a story of the woman with the issue of blood and Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and his daughter who is dying. We're going to go Luke uh, 8, 40, and we're going to read through verse 44, and then we'll jump over to verse 48. It says, So it was that when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting on him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, who was the ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet, and he begged him to come to his house. So imagine this, that Jairus was not just some random person. He was the leader of the synagogue in that area. So this is one of the most prestigious people in the city. And, of course, at that time, the religious leader was the most prestigious. So he, Jesus is walking through. The multitude are now waiting for him to be healed and to hear what he has to say. And the leader, the spiritual leader of that area, Jairus, falls down at his feet and begins to beg him to come to his house. Verse 42. For he had only one daughter, uh, about 12 years of age, and she was dying 
But as he went, the multitudes throng him. Now, there's other uh, scriptures that talk about the same story. And so Jesus says, yes, I'll go with you. And as Jesus is following Jairus, these multitudes of people are slowing him down. Have you ever felt like you wanted Jesus or needed Jesus to do a miracle in your life and he's being distracted by other people's prayers? Come on, that means whenever you're believing God for something, somebody else has a testimony and you're like, he got to you first, but he's going to get to me next. All right, and then next down the line, it hadn't happened. And then you start getting frustrated when somebody has a testimony because you're like, it's been 12 years. I've been believing God, and oh, I'm so, oh, God gave you this. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you got a car. I just need God to give me the ministry he's called me to. That's more important than a car, but whatever. I'll let you do your thing, right? We can easily resent the fact that it seems like God's taking too long. Can I tell you, God will never do it in your timeline. Like, even if you pick the right date that God had planned, he would go, yep, no, it's not that date. We're moving it, right? So he's never going to do it in your timeline. And so it says here that they're slowing him down. Verse 43, And now, on top of all this, a woman having an issue or a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and couldn't be healed by any of them, she came, verse 44, from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately, her flow of blood stopped. Now, I want to tell you something. Frontier, I said, you know, faith versus fear, the final frontier. Frontier means a border. You know, the frontier in the Western days was the border of the civilized world and the Wild West. That frontier is right there at the edge of what you know, what's safe, and what you don't know, and don't know if it's safe. And that border, that frontier, your faith and fear is going to be the limitation of where that border is in your life, and you will never pass either one of them. So if you can get fear out of your life, then your only limitation is your ability to believe God. If you can believe it, God can do it. Nothing's impossible to God. But he says, I can't do anything without faith. So my ability in your life, God says, is limited by your capacity to receive. So if you are thinking small or your faith is small, then God has to be small, if you will, in his ability to move in your life because he won't encroach upon your faith. He says, wherever your line of faith is, I can do wonders in that realm. So you you have here... This woman, she touches the border of his garment. Interesting, that word border there. And then in verse 48, let's keep reading here. It says, and when he, now, this is after the woman, you know, Jesus said, who touched me? And she was nervous because she said, man, I didn't want anyone to know this. And now Jesus stopped everybody. The disciples say, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. And in verse 48, he says to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well or made you whole. Go in peace. We talked about that a few weeks ago in our peace series. Your faith has made you well or whole. Go in peace. And while he was still speaking, someone now remember, Jairus is waiting this whole time. His daughter is like at the verge of death. It was already too late when he got there. Now the throngs of people are slowing him down. Now this woman with the issue of blood distracts Jesus. Jesus stops. And the whole time you can tell the enemy's telling Jairus, hurry up, hurry up. Your daughter's going to die. Jesus is going to miss it. It's too late now. Have you ever felt like the enemy is telling you not enough time? It's too late. You better hurry. Anytime you're pressured to act, don't. There is never pressure, fear. All pressure is is a fear of missing out. So if you're pressured to make a quick decision, do not make that decision. You know, speaking of Father's Day, one of the things my dad told me when I was younger that really stuck with me that I have now used with my boys and and told a lot of people in ministry that, and I think I just take the credit now, and I'm like, you know, I have wisdom I've learned over the years, and one of the things, but one of the things he told me is he says, anytime you're making a very big decision, at least wait 24 hours and sleep on it first. So don't go shopping for a car and buy it the moment you go shopping. Why? Because your emotions are going to take over. You're going to smell that addictive smell in the new car, and you're going to make it quick. He said, sleep on it. Even if you think you know you're supposed to do it, sleep on it first and wait 24 hours. And can I tell you how many decisions have changed in my life when I waited 24 hours? Why? Because the emotions wear off, and then you can see clearly. If your emotions are hot, let me tell you, whether that's good or bad, you're not going to make a wise choice. So that was free. That was something the Lord showed me years ago in faith as my prayed. Okay, so uh, we need to not rush this moment. So he's feeling rushed. And then it says in verse 49, while he's still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and said to him, hey, your daughter's dead now. Don't trouble the teacher. It's too late. She's already died. Verse 50. But when Jesus heard it, he answered and said, don't be afraid, only believe. Say, don't be afraid. 
That's point number one. Only believe. Okay, this, what you just said, is the key to victory in your life, if you can catch it right here. Don't be afraid. He didn't say it to Jesus. Jairus didn't go to Jesus and say, they just said my daughter's dead. Jesus heard it, whether he heard it with his ears or Jesus could perceive things, he could hear everybody's thoughts. And so at that moment, he heard that and he said, stop right there before your mind goes on a rabbit trail. Can you imagine someone coming to you saying your, your only daughter's dead, your only son is dead? I mean, just imagine the thoughts that flooded his mind and heart at that moment. And Jesus had to stop him there and say, wait, don't be afraid. Only believe. And then what? She'll be made well. So that means if you don't fear and you have faith and walk in faith, then the answer or the miracle is activated and you will get it. So let's take the opposite of that. What if he feared and didn't believe? She would stay dead. Jesus is saying, this is the moment you have to choose to not fear and only believe. Verse 51, and when he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, don't weep, for she's dead. She's not dead, but only sleeping. Verse 53, and they all laughed and ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. Can you imagine how dense you have to be to laugh at God when he says, I'm going to raise her up? And you're like, ha, 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 she's already dead. God, you're too late. I know you created the heavens and the earth, but there's no possible way. This situation's impossible. Let me tell you, what happened right after that? Verse 54, he kicked them all out. That's my translation right there. He put them outside. He said, because your doubt, unbelief, and fear cannot be in the location of the miraculous move that's about to happen because faith and fear cannot occupy the same mind or the same place. That's, that is a revelation. Faith and fear cannot occupy the same place. So you can't be in fear and in faith at the same time. So if there's fear and doubt around you, you have to do whatever it takes to kick it out of your life so that you can walk in faith and see the plan of God come to pass in your life, the miraculous. If you're believing God for healing, fire every friend or family member that has doubt that God's going to heal you. Because if you don't, you are going to let their thinking, that fear, become toxic to your faith, and it's going to permeate, and faith and fear can't coexist. So if you let fear come in, your faith has just left, and you will die of that disease. Because if you fear not and only believe, she'll be raised. The opposite is, if you fear and don't have faith, nothing happens. This principle works in any area of your life in any season. You want God to move on your behalf? Fear not and only believe. And in verse 55... Well, verse 54, he kicked them all out, took her by the hand and said, little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned. She arose immediately and he commanded that she be given something to eat. Powerful moment right here. Jesus says, only faith, only believe and watch what God can do. He said, if you stay in faith and don't fear, the miracle happens. So you can't have a, faith and fear can't cooperate. Listen how I say that, they can't cooperate. So they can't work together. And I want you to think about in your life how much fear is leading you. I'm going to explain in a moment the four core fears that every one of us are attacked with that have to get delivered from in our life. And many times the lens that we see life through is through those core fears. And if you're seeing life based upon fears that might happen, might not happen, then your whole world is void of faith. And you have just neutralized the miraculous power of God on your behalf. So fear cannot even be tolerated. It needs to become detestable to you. Fear needs to be a curse word. It doesn't exist in your life because as soon as you let it creep into your thought life and your heart, you are now pushing out faith in your life. They are, let me give you this, and I'm going to jump in because I'm running out of time. Faith and fear are spiritual delivery systems. They deliver the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Without faith, it's impossible to receive from God. Without fear, it's impossible to receive anything from Satan. So he can't do anything in your life if you won't fear. It's literally the same force in opposite directions. He rules through fear. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. It says, 
Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. That through death, speaking of Jesus, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those, listen to this, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So the fear of death is what subjects you to bondage or oppression. So the enemy loses all his power to create oppression and bondage in your life when the fear of death leaves your life. Romans 8, 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So fear, it has no place in the heart of a child of God. Now, this fear of death, just to tell you real quickly, started with Adam. What happened? When Adam and Eve sinned, they now welcomed death into their life and into the world. Nothing could die. There was no death, disease, darkness, anything on all the earth when Adam and Eve were walking with the Lord before sin. As soon as sin came, death followed with it. Now, the result of that sin, that spiritual death, is everything in this life that is from the enemy. That's disease, that's sickness, that's hatred, that's strife, that's uh, fear, anything. It all came as a result of spiritual death by sin. So now that fear of death is not just the fear of physically dying, it's the fear of the results of everything that came with that death, which is all darkness in the world today. Now I wanna give you four core fears, and I want you to recognize how the enemy tries to operate in your life to try to steal faith and to get you over into this area because God wants to do miracles in this generation like you do not even realize. It's The world is not gonna look the same. And I know you're like, Pastor, you've been saying that for a while now. I'm gonna say it until all of you are seeing it everywhere you go because I'm telling you what God says will come to pass. And we are seeing a vast change. Ever since 2020 and coronavirus, I feel like everything was just, just sped up. It just seems like now everyone's starting to see these things everywhere around them. And the most important thing is that you recognize that faith is empowered through love. So if you want to walk in faith, then love is what activates or works faith. 1 John 4.18 says there is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear. Galatians 5.6, you can write it down, says faith works through love. So if faith can't work without love, and love is what? Love is all about others, right? Love God and love people. So as you're now focused on God, the two things Jesus said, just focus on this, love me with all your heart and love the person next to you. If you do that, everything else will work itself out in your life. So love is outward focused, and now your faith can operate at maximum efficiency. Here's the opposite. If faith works through love, Fear works through self-centeredness or selfishness. Fear actually is empowered and works through self-centered thinking. So fear is about me. Whenever fear is operating, you are thinking only of yourself. And you're thinking of how this affects me and how this affects mine, and how this affects my world, and my family, and my things, and it's all about self. And faith is thinking about others and God, and it's operating according to love. And so it's important that we recognize that if you're self-focused, how am I affected by this? If you take that into a relationship, how does that person affect me, make me happy, hurt me? Whatever they do, I'm thinking about how it affects me then you are now in fear of losing that relationship, of messing that relationship up. Whatever it is, you are now being toxic to that marriage or that relationship or that friendship. Why? Because it's self-centeredness. Fear is activated when you think about yourself. Faith is activated when you're thinking about God and others. So these core fears, I want to tell you that because they're a lens with which many people see the entire world. Every person, every season you're seeing through these fears, and now you have become a fear-based person instead of a faith-based child of God. What are the four core fears? You might find some of them in this. Number one, fear of death. Fear of death. That's not just physical death, which it includes, but the fear of loss. It could be the fear of death of someone around you. It could be the fear of you ending your life. It's the fear of pain and destruction in your life. Maybe not just physical death, but the death of your job or your marriage or your uh, relationship with your kids or whatever that fear of that thing dying 
That's one of the most core root fears. Actually, all fear comes from the fear of death. I, I wish I could talk about that and prove it to you, but let me just give you the second one. Second core fear, fear of rejection. Not being enough, not being wanted. People don't care. People don't think. About, I'm fearing rejection. So now that lens that I see through, I will act in accordance with trying to not be rejected, which literally makes or creates rejection in your life because you are rejecting others as you're afraid to be rejected. So these fears are so sly that the enemy has perfected his ability to deceive people into these fears. Do not give in to the fear of death or the fear of rejection. Third one is the fear of failure, wasting my life on a dead end being seen as a failure, insignificant, remaining stagnant. What if it doesn't work? What if people laugh? What if they think, man, he tried, but he was a failure? That can paralyze you. It will not allow you to walk by faith in this life if you give into the fear of failure. And the fourth one is the fear of lack, not having enough, going without. What if it doesn't happen? What if I don't have it? These four fears of death, rejection, failure, and lack are the core fears that the enemy uses the fruit of these in different ways to try to steal faith in the lives of the children of God and paralyze them in this life. It's so dangerous. Fear cannot be tolerated. Let me give you four quick things of why fear is dangerous because I feel like as God's doing all these things in this world right now and he wants to do things with you, he's telling us as Life Church, step out into the unknown and take territory and reach people that are unreached and do something never has been done in the world. What we're our vision this next season, I can't see anything quite exactly like it anywhere else on earth. I can't say, well, they did it just like that, and that works. I'm going to do what they did. God is calling us to a new thing. We're stepping out in this realm. If we give in to fear in any way in our life, we are literally stopping the flow of the miraculous in this season. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to limit God in my life. So, so fear has to be kicked out. Why is it so dangerous? Number one, your heart God created our heart to create what it contains. Whatever is in your heart, your heart is created by God to create that in your life. So what your heart is full of, your life will be defined by. It creates what's inside of it. Look at Matthew 9, 21. This is the woman with the issue of blood. This is another part uh, in Matthew of the same story that we read in Luke. And it said, she kept saying to herself, if I only may touch his garment, I shall be restored to hell. This woman, as she crawled to Jesus, she had faith in her heart that all I have to do is make contact with Jesus and everything is okay. I'm totally healed. I have the miracle. My life is restored. Now, what was she talking and thinking constantly? Faith. That's all. No fear. All I got to do is touch him. So what happened? Her heart went to working that in her life, and then Jesus didn't say, I am healing you. He said, your faith has healed you. Why? Because faith is a delivery system for the kingdom of God. So without that faith, Jesus, listen to this, couldn't have healed her. Jesus wishes no one would perish. God loves everyone. There were people that were dying all around Jesus when he was walking this earth. 2,000 years ago. He walked into uh, uh, the place to heal the man that was lame, uh, and uh, I can't think of the name right now, uh, um, Bethesda, Pool of Bethesda, and there were five colonnades or porches of sick people with terminal illness everywhere. He walked past everybody to that man, healed him, and walked right past everybody and left. God. So what is the only limitation to what God can do in our life? Our ability to receive your faith, your capacity. Jesus saw something in that man. There was faith that was hidden way down in there and Jesus woke it up and instantly his faith healed him. So fear is dangerous because it, you, your heart creates what it contains. So if your heart's in fear, you are blocking what God wants to do. Your heart's a spiritual system that is meant to take what you feed it and make it a reality. Mark chapter four, you can read it later. Parable of the seed. Whatever you put in your heart, it's gonna become a reality in your life. That's intake and outflow. Come on, bad in, bad out. Faith in, faith out. Fear in, fear out. Guard your heart with all diligence, the scripture says. So whatever you intake is what propels your life. Let me tell you, don't meditate on the fear of death, the fear of lack, the fear of insufficiency, the fear of rejection, any of those things that is being fed around you or talked to you, don't allow that in. I'll even tell Pastor Tony sometime, I'll say, he'll say, man, I, I, he might need to say something or maybe something 
was said or some negative thing. I was like, just don't tell me. Like, if I don't need to address it, just let it attack you all night. I'm going to be free. I'm like, I mean, because, because I know that if that's fed to me, then I'm going to have to work for the next three hours to get that out of my system so that I can take territory for the kingdom of God and advance way beyond what's possible in the natural. And I don't have time to waste. So guess what? Don't tell me about it. There are times that I want to tell uh, my wife some things that I realize if I say this to her, it's going to be toxic in her heart, and now she is going to either have to fight that, give in to it, and I'm going to bring her down. And there are many times things she doesn't know right now. I mean, I tell my wife everything she needs to know. I'm not mean like that. But there's things that I could tell her right now that she, it doesn't even affect her, but I could literally take faith, take fear and put it in there and take faith out of her heart by saying that. Sometimes you just guard your mouth and say, you know what, I'm not going to tell them that. Don't begin to spread that darkness. You speak life. The Bible says life and death is in the power of your tongue. So guess what? I'm not going to speak what the enemy's doing. Intake and outflow. So if you're intaking things that you don't want to see in your life, then your life is defined by that. Then let me ask you, what are you intaking? Don't expect a different 2023 if you're feeding on 2022. Because you're intaking, you're going to get the same thing you got last year if you don't change the intake. What are you eating, spiritually speaking? If you feed on fear, you're going to strengthen fear in your life. So, number two, why is fear so dangerous? Satan uses fear to control us. He will try to create fear around you to cause you to avoid it. Fear works, listen, this is a powerful thing if you understand it. Fear works through anticipation. Fear is anticipating a destructive thing in the future or a negative thing. So now when you anticipate the negative in your life, you are giving strength to fear in your life. So if Satan wants to control you, because what do you do if, you, if your solution to fear, if it works through anticipation, then you want to, if you want to get rid of fear, we try to eliminate the thing that we think is threatening us. If we're anticipating the negative and we're in fear, then now our whole life is spent around changing or stopping that thing that is, is threatening to have this thing in the future in my life. So now, instead of pursuing God and his will, we're trying to fix that so that it doesn't happen to have that in the future. And now we are attacking the wrong thing and focus the wrong place. So guess what? It's a negative expectation, and the enemy now uses that to bring fear into our heart. Look at Hebrews 11.1. It'll make sense. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So what is fear? It's the substance of things avoided and the threat of things not seen. Fear, it gives substance to the things that you're anticipating to avoid in your life. So avoidance empowers fear. So how does the enemy direct people's life? If I were to throw a pit viper down in your path as you're walking out of church today, a live one, a rattlesnake, would you alter your path? Raise your hand if you'd alter your path out there right in front of you. Why? Because there is this thought of, that is a rattlesnake. I could die. My kids could die. I could be bit. And so you will now alter your path to avoid the thing that you're anticipating could cause destruction in your life in the future. So how can Satan, you say, well, I'll never listen to the devil. I love God. I'm not going to let him lead me. Guess what? If he can throw that down figuratively, that snake in your life, and you're afraid of that thing so much, you will do anything to avoid it and alter your life around it. Now he can direct you by putting things that you fear in your way so you'll avoid them in your life. So he will cause every, and you're like, how is the one thing I fear? I remember a season of my life years ago, I was fearing death. I went, and I was younger and healthier back then. I'm like, man, I don't fear it any now. I'm like, I, the way I look now, I should fear it more, but I don't, right? But back then I was. And I remember the enemy made sure that everything that had to do with death, disease, incurable things, I had knowledge of it. Come on, have you ever been, anyone ever else dealt with that before besides me? Have you noticed when you're in that season, everything you see has to do with it? I remember I was, I was fearing a certain type of cancer. It's so dumb. I mean, I don't even know how the enemy got that into my heart, but I was like, that's, that is probably how the devil's, that's how I'm going to die. I just know it. I don't know. And as soon as I Googled it, now all of a sudden, everything I learned was a symptom I immediately started having in my life, and it was confirming it. And then everywhere I went, I would hear, I would see commercials about that disease. People would talk to me and go, I even, one guy I knew that was my age, man, the devil's 
ticks me off sometimes. This guy was my age, and he walks in. I don't even know him that well, but he, he worked on uh, our copier, actually, at the time. And he came in, and that guy was diagnosed with the exact same disease that I was fearing and told me every detail of how he came to the place of being diagnosed with it and the symptoms he was having months before he was diagnosed with it. And the whole time, he's telling me all this, and I'm now all of a sudden, I'm feeding on all those things. Why? Because, once again, faith, if, if the enemy can direct your life, he can put what you fear in front of you, and he can alter everything in your life because you fear that so much. The Bible says to fear the Lord. Why? Because if you fear and reverence and honor him only, then nothing moves you because you only fear the Lord. So it's important that we don't allow that root of fear in our life in anything. And next thing I know, I had like two years I dealt with that. It was a crazy, and I was in ministry. It was before we started Life Church, but I remember Courtney be asleep at night, and I look over, I mean, I believed it so much that I look over to her and be crying at night. You're probably laughing because I think you went through this too, right? And I remember thinking, I love you. I would just whisper to her like, I won't see you tomorrow morning. And I'd go look at my boys and be like, I'm gone. I mean, it was so real. I laugh now because I'm like, how dumb. I, I allowed the enemy. But in that season, I, it was the most real thing in the world to me. And I'm telling you, you might say, oh, I never dealt with that. It could be you a fear of failure. It could be a fear of lack. It could be fear of rejection. And now you're altering your life to not have to face any of those things. If Goliath is in the middle of a valley, it might be that he's a sign God wants you to take that valley. Because the enemy is going to place fear on the territory that God has given you to try to keep you off of that territory. So he'll say, I'll just divert your life. So maybe the fear around you is the very place that you're supposed to have possession of. You're supposed to have victory there. But instead, the enemy thought, well, I know he'll react to this. It's like that rattlesnake. He'll just turn the other way and never see what God has for him right here. That Goliath is a sign that God wants you to take that place. Fear is dangerous, number three, because it makes you weak and vulnerable. It steals your joy. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. So guess what? Fear, if it takes joy, it weakens you in your life. When you're thinking about the loss, the lack, the rejection, the failure, all of these things, then you are now taking joy and peace and you're handing it over to your adversary. And now you are weak spiritually and you're vulnerable to anything because your defenses are down. Number four, fear is dangerous because it's the greatest obstacle to success and victory. Why is that? Once again, that territory. The enemy will use that fear to stop you from taking the territory that God wants you to have in this season of your life. Joshua, when he told him to cross the land, It says right across the land where God said Joshua would take that territory, it was the land of the Hittites. Do you know what the Hittites, the root word of that name means? Terror. Terrorism. Terrorism is just fear as a weapon. You know that, right? Terrorism is fear weaponized. So the Hittites were fear. They they had terror. And so God said, I want you to take that land, and of course, The occupants of the land that God said to take is fear in its most pure form. And Joshua's going, wait, wait, why did God tell him? Now that makes sense when God said, don't be afraid, be courageous and strong, take the land. God said it three times, don't fear, be courageous. Don't fear, why? Because terror and fear was occupying the land that Joshua was supposed to take. He places that intimidation between you and your mission. Happened with Moses And the 12 spies, they were afraid of the giants. It happened all throughout Scripture. So walking by faith is the only way to advance in this life. And you want to be right in the middle of what God's doing these days? Start practicing that right now in your life with little things. You might just need to exercise your faith small. I remember I was believing God for great miracles and, and, and healing miracles, and I used to go to the hospitals, and I was in Bible college and pray for random people. We went up and down. I didn't even ask permission. We'd start at the, the highest uh, floor, and I would go room to room, me and my friend, and uh, we would just lay hands on sick people and see miracles like, yeah, I wish I could tell you all day long stuff. I mean, I don't, I, I don't even have time. Maybe next week I will. I'm talking accurate things. A man, an old preacher on his deathbed after 60 years and said, God, send a messenger, an angel or something, and tell me that I didn't give my whole life to you to die of this disease. As soon as he prayed that, we both walked into his room. And he thought, he, first thing he said, he goes, are you an angel? I was like, I'm definitely not. Are you an angel? I'm not an angel. And we prayed over him. 
This man was in his 80s, and he was instantly healed of that disease with doctors' verified reports because we were just a vessel that we're doing what God told us to do. So in that, but when I was believing God for those things, I remember my pastor told me, he goes, well, uh, don't try to start here. If you just believe God for a headache first, pray for somebody that has a headache first. Don't try to eat the whole elephant there. Just start somewhere. You might believe in for God's, you know, to take care of you financially, whatever it is. Then believe God to pay your electric bill first before you believe God to give you an $8 million building or a business out here. You have to grow in faith. Start small. How can you activate your faith today? What can you do before you go to sleep tonight to activate faith in your life? And what is faith? It's called walking by faith because faith, I'm going to give you a whole free thing right here. I'm going to end the sermon because this is, this is good. Faith is the currency of heaven. Faith is what you spend. It's the currency. It literally is when you spend faith, heaven responds and meets that currency and, and provides what it's bought. Why? Because Jesus paid for it, but your faith is what receives whatever Jesus has already paid to give you. So if faith is the currency of heaven, then it's important that you recognize that you have to use faith so that you can receive the benefits of heaven. How do you do it? Faith without works is dead. That means this. You can't say you're in faith and just have lip service. Faith has action attached to it. So to spend your faith, action has to be followed. So say, I'm in faith. Now, you're not in faith until you actually step in faith. So that's why God told me, he said, well, you know, I want you to believe this community center. I was like, okay, God, we're having faith, Lord. Come on, we're going to raise money for that. And God said, okay, but you haven't acted yet, so I can't do anything because you're just talking faith. You're not living it. So he said, spend this money. It was a lot. He goes, have the architectural drawings done, do all these things, and then watch what I'll do. And it wasn't until I paid well, we paid, the church paid tens of thousands of dollars to have all this stuff done. And then as soon as we did that, it made no sense because like we didn't have any of the money. And God said debt free. I'm like, really? You want the church to not be in debt? Okay, great. And he said, do this first. As soon as we did that, all the wisdom came and the doors began to open. And God said, now this is the next step. Here's how everything is going to happen. It's done. And it wasn't until, and now half that y'all don't even know yet because we're walking it out behind the scenes. But let me tell you, God is doing this because we just stepped out. So you're like, God, I'm believing for whatever it is. You know what? Step. Just do something in the direction of your faith. And it's got to be something to where uh, it takes faith to do. Not like, okay, Lord, I believe you. No. What is an action that you can do to move in the direction of the promise of God in your life? So faith is so important. Let me give you four things for that real quick. I'm just going to give you the points. The kingdom of God will not go where faith doesn't take it. If we're called to expand the kingdom, if you're not walking in faith, you can't expand the kingdom. Believe God. Expand. Number two, faith is the medium exchange or the currency of heaven or the kingdom. Number three, it activates the supernatural in the natural world. As soon as you release faith, you're activating the supernatural power of God in this physical world. Jesus is doing miracles today like he did in Scripture. He hasn't changed. He never changes. Number four, Faith is needed to release the blessing of God in this earth. You have to walk by faith. Everyone stand up with me if you would. So in this season, I want to I just encourage you, don't tolerate fear. Whatever it is that the enemy has used to bring fear into your life, not going to happen, I'm going to be a failure, not have enough, you cannot let that marinate stay root in your mind. Become accountable to somebody next to you and say, look, the enemy is trying to get me in fear in this area. If I talk about it, bring it up or anything, remind me of that because I'm not going to allow it to rest in my thinking any longer. And as soon as you do that, you now have room for faith to activate in your life. And it's guaranteed, Mark 11 says, when we exercise and release our faith, we're guaranteed to have results. God always comes through. So if we're not seeing God at all in our life anywhere, it might be that we're not in faith anywhere in our life. You can say it, what are your actions backing up? Father, I just pray right now, Lord, that you would just, just stretch us in this season. Lord, I pray that we get past uh, just all the, the excuses and the thinking of the past and all the words that have been said to us that weren't of you, God. All the fear and the, the fear of death, Lord. The fear of rejection, Father. The fear of not having enough, Lord. The fear of failure. Father, I pray right now that you would just highlight that. What the enemy has tried to plant into our path to stop us from advancing. And Lord, I thank you in this season of our life, Lord, we will not stop in front of the giant. We will not 
just give territory or forfeit what you've given us because of fear. We choose to move forward, God. And Lord, I thank you that you're responsible for making yourself look good. As we are in obedience to you, you promise us, Lord, for results. And so I thank you if it's healing, if it's wisdom, Lord, if it's finances, Father, whatever that is needed. As your people respond in faith, Lord, I thank you that testimonies would erupt in this place, God. Lord, that we would begin to hear of victory every day, every week, Lord, constantly, Father. And I thank you, Lord, that you're faithful to fulfill your word in these last days. Lord, thank you for choosing us, God, to be alive at a time such as this, Lord. And we say, here we are, Lord, send us, use us. We, we yield to you, Holy Spirit. And I thank you for victory in every way. And Lord, we thank you right now. All the money that's needed, all the favor that's needed, all the doors that need to be open for this territory that we're taking as a church, the community center, the work in the schools, Lord, our small groups, the media, everything. Lord, I thank you it's already provided. We rest in that, Lord. And as we move forward as a family, a spiritual family, I thank you, Lord, that we are going to experience explosive, just exponential increase, Lord, in each of our individual lives as well as corporately even this year, before December 31st, Lord, let it be a testimony to you. In Jesus' name, amen.